Welcome to Kingdom Reality, your gateway to deep insights into the truths and realities of God's kingdom. Dive deep into the teachings of esteemed teachers of God's Word as they illuminate the mysteries of Scripture, offering priceless wisdom and revelations. Our channel serves as a beacon of enlightenment, guiding seekers on a transformative journey towards understanding the essence of divine truth and purpose. Join us as we explore the depths of spiritual reality and embark on a quest for genuine understanding and spiritual growth, revealing kingdom realities. Step into the refreshing flow of the rivers of living water, a powerful message by Apostle Michael Orokpo. Discover how to tap into the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. Experience the renewal and strength that comes from divine nourishment. Feel the unity and joy that springs from the well of God's presence. Let the rivers of living water flow through you, bringing life and transformation, guiding you to the source of divine life and power. Glory to God. I want to honor all the ministers that are here. Thank you for coming. And of course, everyone who is hungry to receive from the Lord. Can you lift your hands toward heaven one more time and talk to the Father from the depth of your heart. Whisper to him from the place of intimacy. Talk to him from the depth of your soul. He said they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion that appeared before the Lord. Times of refreshing, the Bible says, come from the presence of the Lord. Can you ask him for refreshing tonight? Can you ask him for strength? Ask him to, to speak to your heart, to inspire you, to take you to higher levels of glory. We've been so blessed already by the many ministers that have come. Or can you ask the Lord for yet another dimension? Talk to the Father. Make it personal. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, precious Lord. We bless you. We give you glory. We've come again to receive. We ask that you saturate us. We ask that you fill us afresh. We ask that you shift us to higher levels of glory by your word and by your spirit. We ask that you strengthen us. Bring us into higher pedestals in the spirit where we represent your interest, your government, and advance the frontiers of your kingdom. Tonight is that night where the waters will be stirred and we will draw from the everlasting fountains of your spirit. Lord, we come hungry, we come with passion, we come with expectations. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because we know that all that we desire and much more you will do. We give you all the glory, we give you all the praise. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' precious name. You may be seated. I'm tempted to sing, but when I saw the timer. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Tonight, I want to just share with us very briefly on the two rivers that we are expected to allow flow out of our vessels. The magnitude of investment of God in the human spirit cannot be quantified. In my study of scripture, I came to realize that the zenith of God's creative enterprise is demonstrated in the human vessel. When you study the angelic ranking, you find a lot of glory. The splendor is unimaginable. But you see, the vastness of what God has installed in the human vessel surpasses everything in the angelic order. The reason you are easily wowed about the angelic realm is because the glory of the angelic is external. And so when you find some angels, they glow like diamonds. Some glow like flames of fire. Some angels are giants. When they stand on the earth, their head pierces through the cloud. It's a phenomenon civilization. However, none of that compared to what is in man because in man is the fullness of God. The Bible said, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And I, I discovered the reason God decided to hide the glory of man is because if that glory is manifested, you'll be tempted to worship man because the fullness of God dwells in man. In fact, when God decided to manifest visibly, the only vessel he took upon himself was man. So in all of God's creation, the only habitation 
that could host the fullness and the totality of God was the human vessel. In fact, God asked the question. He said, where is the house that you have made for me? Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. That means there's nothing in creation that can host God. But when God decided to manifest, he said he pleased the Father that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in Christ. And Christ took upon himself the human form. And so there is something about man that has not been understood. And so in this conference, we trust the Lord to help us pipe into the rivers that are in our spirits so that they can find expression. Glory to God. It is my desire that at the end of this conference, all of us will live here as entities of wonder. That we wow our generation and manifest the excellency of God's glory. In the name of Jesus. Genesis chapter 1 from verse 26. The Lord was speaking to himself. You know, there are times I was sharing with my people on Sunday and I told them, there are works that God delegates to angels. But there are certain works that God does himself. Creation is one of them. You can't delegate that assignment to any being because nobody has the blueprint. In fact, the codes are locked in the Godhead. Only God knows it. Creation is one of it. Redemption is another. These assignments, you can't, de you can't delegate them. Only God can do them. Because we're dealing with a subject People ask questions. They say, God is not married. How can God have a son? You, have you heard such things before? <laughs> you know, essentially speaking, God is one being. But in manifestation, he takes three forms. Because he has an administration that only him can actualize. So God has to manifest in different forms so that God can run God's errand. <laughs> in order for God to run God's errand. Because if you send an angel to create, an angel will become creator. So when the way God works is, God is sitting. And when God speaks, you know, I'm talking, you are hearing sound. But when God speaks, the voice of God works. The Bible said in Genesis 3.8, it said the voice of God came walking in the garden. So when God speaks, it's not volume. When God speaks, the voice of God is a person. So the God that sits on the throne, who originates the voice, is called Father. The one that goes out to walk is called son. So it's not about wife and husband. It's a, a separation that is captured within spiritual intelligence. You, you don't have to marry to have a child. Even in biology, we know that Amoeba can divide into two. And both is the same. Are you following this? So the, the, the mysteries are much. Now when God wanted to extend his possibilities outside of himself he decided to create an entity that will mirror him and that was when man came into the scene and so in genesis chapter 1 verse 26 god speaking he said let us make man in our own image after our likeness and so when you want to find god outside of god the only place you should trace him is a man let us make man in our own image after our likeness and so too much is locked into the human vessel one of our major responsibilities as we walk through time is to tap into the frequency of our inner man and draw out the resources of god that is locked there but you see this assignment is not wished it's a responsibility and that's why the theme of the conference is let the river flow because greatness is not for irresponsible people. You have to let the river flow. First Thessalonians 5.5, 5, he said, you are the children of light. So every one of us here is light, but not everyone shines. For you to shine, Matthew 5.16 says, let your light shine. Because you were born to shine. He was a burning and a shiny light. So if you don't take responsibility, you can't manifest. So the call of this conference, first of all, is to show you who you are and to show you how to release what you carry. If you don't know who you are, you can't release what you carry. 
And if you know who you are, then you take responsibility to release what you carry. So you have not come to this conference except as you begin to understand man from another dimension. Because some of the things we know about ourselves is what circumstance told us. But I came to tell you what your designer said. Because the one who knows you best is the one who sculpted you. He said you were fearfully and wonderfully made. In Ephesians 2.10, he said we are God's craftsmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus unto every good works. I came to tell you by the authority of scripture that everything you have gone through is a mirage. That's not who you are. The identity you command is the one God said. And by the time we are done routing what God said, then we will find out what to do in order to manifest what God said. Because everyone seated here, listen, you are not supposed to do your best. You are supposed to manifest God. Because what you call your best may not be good enough. But when you manifest God, it will be well enough. Because somebody can say he's doing his best. His best is at the level of his education. His best is at the level, like God's servant was sharing, at the level of help that he has received from men. All of that is good. But when God created us, he wanted us to manifest him. So when God comes, he's not primarily looking for your best. He's looking for himself in what you are doing. You are supposed to manifest God in everything you do. Because the raw material for your making is God. He said we were created in Christ Jesus unto every good works. God breathed out of his spirit and the man became a living soul. So you are supposed to give expression. That's why Paul said, henceforth, know we, no man after the flesh. You carry something that your generation is looking for. And until that thing manifests, whatever you are doing is not good enough. There are many people doing great things, but there's no God's signature there. That is not good enough. Until God can be seen through you, you have not begun to exist. And this conference is designed to make sure that the God dimension in you begins to find expression. Now, when I looked at the scripture, I saw some of the records of the patriarchs. And I told myself, this thing we are doing is either it's a joke or we have not understood what God is expecting. Because the testimony of this man is so supernatural that if we are not careful in our generation the bible will be called a book of fairies we'll make the scripture look like fairy tales because our disadvantage will make it look as if what was said in time past were not true and when people read the bible they will say they are fictions because the only reason they will believe what was said two thousand years ago is if we can manifest it now so the same way the Bible is a witness, you too are a witness. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and be witnesses unto me. So on one side, the world witness. On another side, we are also witnesses. But we can't witness until the rivers begin to flow. Romans 15 verse 4, he said, the things that were written aforetime, he said, they were written for our land. So that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Before I show you the rivers of your spirit, let me show you some of the things that were manifested before you came. Because if you are not careful, you will think what you are offering is all God has to offer. A generation has demonstrated something before we came. And as far as God's calendar is concerned, we should manifest superior dimensions because it's from glory to glory. If we can manifest what they have manifested, then we are in trouble already. This is why everybody here must become dangerously deliberate about manifesting God. Genesis 14, verse 14 to 15, we saw the life of Abraham. One man had 318 trained servants. What 
economic structure was he working with? That was a city in one man's hands. Those were servants. And they had enough to train servants. Today we are struggling with one nanny. We can't pay our children's school fees. And we are serving the same God. There is something we don't understand. Abraham was going to fight against four kings with servants he trained in his house. They had competence that was superior to armies trained by four different nations. Because he was not just working with principles, he had mysteries. If you read verse 15 of that scripture, the Bible said, and Abraham divided himself among men. So the people who went to war were not 318 servants plus Abraham. They were 319 Abrahams. He had the technology. He divided himself among men. A theologian can say they grouped themselves into four. That's not what the Bible is saying. This was a technology of priesthood that Abraham caught. God told him, I will bless you and make you a great nation. And from you, nation shall be born. So Abraham knew he was not a man. Abraham knew that worst case, he was a nation. So if Abraham put himself in you, then you too become a nation. That's why there was no record that there was casualty. Because it was 319 nations against four nations. What did the man know? Where did he enter in God that made him wield that level of power? And here we are struggling with people who are inconsequential and we call it warfare. What battles are we fighting? One man stood up without any prior information. They have arrested your nephew Lot. Four kings have taken him. Hey, stand up. 318 servants stood up and they went to battle, defeated them and came back. When the king wanted to gift him, he said, no, I won't take a latchet from you. Lest you say you made Abraham rich. My wealth come from yonder. My God supplies my need. I'm richer than the nations of the earth. What did he know? These are the men who came before we showed up. So when you are telling God, this battle is too much. Ten people have gone up against me. Say ten people. Didn't you read about your fathers? One took four nations who are ten men. That's why he said, surely they shall gather, but it shall not be by me. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment. He didn't say God shall condemn. No. He said thou shall condemn. Thou shall condemn. Because there is something that passes through your spiritual genealogy. One man can take four kings. That's the lineage we come from. We come from a lineage of champions. A man took four nations. And that's not all. After Abraham, Moses showed up. And Moses was trying to do it in the flesh. They said, that's a wrong protocol. Go back to the mountain. There was something Abraham saw. There was a being Abraham encountered. There was a dimension Abraham stepped into. And when Jethro, who is of the descendants of Abraham from Keturah, who understood priesthood, saw that Moses had passion, he told him this thing is beyond passion. Go and encounter Elohim. And the Bible said Moses went to the backside of the wilderness. There he saw a bush burning that was not consumed. And he said, I will turn aside to see this. And suddenly he heard, take off thy sandals. Where you are standing is holy ground. The mortars walk here. Cherubims walk here. Princes of Zion walk here. This is where Elohim dwells. Take off thy sandals. And immediately he followed the new protocol. And they told him, you don't need extra weapon. The staff you have is enough. Drop it. He dropped it. He became a serpent. Pick it by the tail. He picked it. Go. You have been fortified. What is going on here? The man had been changed. In Exodus 7 verse 1. Behold, I have made thee a God unto Pharaoh. So there are men who are God over other men. I'm telling you true. That's the lineage we come from. The hidden are not our contemporaries. They are our servants. And the guy showed up and shut down the biggest civilization of his era. He comes to Pharaoh. The Lord of the Hebrews have sent me. Let my people go that they may serve me. Pharaoh thinks it's a joke. Don't worry, you look for me. The next day, a plague shows up. And after the ninth plague, Moses showed up and said, you will not see me again. 
I come here to see you is a privilege. You will never see me again. And true to his words, he was never seen. And when Moses was living, can we celebrate those? <laughs> Suddenly, sir, the visible Shekinah, Exodus 13, 21, began to walk with an ordinary man. God was escorting him out of Egypt. And he said, the pillar of cloud went after him in the day and the pillar of fire by night. The guy shows up before a sea. There was no canoe. That's what we call an emergency. And he turned to the Lord. They said, why are you turning to me? There is something in your hand. Stretch forth your rod. I'm telling you why you must let the river flow. You carry more than enough for any crisis of life. Stretch forth thy rod. When he stretched the rod, he didn't know what was happening in heaven. See, when what is in you moves, heaven moves. And when he stretched the rod, the Bible said, with a blast of his nostrils, he parted the Red Sea. And over four million men walked through on dry ground. And you think that is all. They enter a wilderness. No economic structure. No security structure. How do you sustain four million people? They needed water. Speak to the rock. Do rock have ears? As if that is not enough. Their clothes didn't tear. Their shoes grew with them. A child of seven months, they make a shoe. He's 30 years, he's still using the same shoe. Because shoe too has technology of compression and compliance under the glory. That's the heritage we come from. That's why when we tell you our God sustains men, we are not psyching you. There are testimonies in scripture. He said the things that were written aforetime, they were written for our learning. If you can trust God, sir. It's not fairy tale. Men have proven his faithfulness. They proved his faithfulness. And that's not all. You read the chronicles and you keep seeing them. Joshua shows up. Joshua chapter 10 from verse 12 to 14. Fighting in a battle. Joshua saw that when it is night, they will be disadvantaged. And the man stood up and said, let the sun stand upon the mountains of Ajalon. Let the moon remain upon the valley of Gibeon. And the Bible said, the man didn't even pray. He was commanding the constellations. The Bible said the sun did not make haste to go down in the day that God hearkened to the voice of a man. If this is the heritage we have received, then it's either we have not known it or what we are doing is a joke. Over my life, oh Yahweh. Over my life, oh Yahweh. Let only you be praised. 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 <laughs> I read about somewhere. I almost started weeping. The Bible said in First Samuel chapter 7. From verse 12 a nation thought Israel was weak they found where to plunder and when they it's time for harvest they come and loot them and suddenly the army was incapacitated and they ran to a prophet a prophet has no gun he has no arrow but he has an altar the Bible says somewhere erected a stone what do these people know he poured oil on it and he called it Ebenezer and he said he said to has the Lord helped us and the Bible said from that day, the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistines. And he said even the land that the Philistines took from the Israelites were restored to them up on the Ekron. They began to enter their own corridors because somebody did something on the altar. That's the heritage we have received. What did this man encounter? What has happened? Because these things trouble my spirit you know what in the realm of witches they preserve their heritage if they tell you witches go for meeting in the night by flight is the same 100 years ago is the same now they maintain their heritage but when we read the stories of the bible and we compare it with our present situation it looks as if we are worshiping different gods meanwhile 
Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What is wrong? What is wrong? Why don't we have hunger and appetite for these things anymore? God's servant was sharing concerning Daniel recently. Daniel was in the city of corruption. Babylon is a land of corruption. But the Bible said in Daniel 1.8, he proposed in his heart that he will not be defied by the portion of the king's meat. And there was no corruption there that affected him. Today you meet Christians, even if it's a bucket of water, we fall inside and we drown. Everybody is struggling with every kind of sin. If you talk, they say it's not easy. It's not easy. You, in fact, people don't believe their righteous men today. When you are talking, they say, oh, more relax. This thing is no, no, forget those things. It's a lie. As if holiness is now alien to our generation. Meanwhile, the testimony of our fathers is such that they walked through Babylon, they were not defied. So much so that they had to gang up to set him up. Yet the man said he will not bow. And when they were to throw them into the fire, they said, oh king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. Holiness is unquestionable. There's no ground for compromise. If you like, throw us into the fire. Our God is able to save us. But in case he chooses not to, we will still not bow. And because of their witness, the Spirit of God came upon them. In Daniel chapter 5 from verse 11 to 14, when the testimony of Daniel was told, it was not a Christian that wrote the Chronicles. It was the hidden queen that spoke about him. He said, there's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. He said, light and understanding is in him and he has the power to explain hard sentences. Go and call him. And the guy shows up without reading any book. He began to tell the king parables of the ancients. He said, God showed favor to your father, gave you a kingdom, and you decide to worship the God of Ayo. He said, that's why this hand came. How do you know where the hand came from? Who taught you the language? Where have you been going to? Now we understand the reason he was superior to Babylon. Because he walked in a civilization that was older and more ancient than Babylon. He said, mene, mene. Take care of a sin. He said, your kingdom has been weighed on the balances. Who told you they weigh men? This is where we are coming from. What we are doing here has a history. What we are doing has a foundation. And there are men who embody the testimonies. That what we are doing is not just religion. We are not fanatics. We have a culture. We have a heritage. We come from a civilization. And we have testimonies to prove the reality and the veracity of that civilization. The names continue unending. Is it Elijah you want to talk about? A man walks to a palace and said, As surely as I live, there shall be no rain or dew except by my word. Do you control weather? And you look at him, you think he's a madman. He walks away. Three months later, you discover he was not bluffing. And the king and all of his servants began to look for Elijah for two years. When they eventually found Elijah, Elijah said, Go and tell the king and come in. Obadiah said, God knows I will leave you. Because we know that you don't travel with chariots. We know you don't travel with horses. You travel with wear wind. How, how did you know that technology at that time? If I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. We know you. You will be trapped. You are like the wind. Meanwhile, this is what Jesus was telling us in John chapter 3. That as the wind blew it. Before Jesus said it, Elijah was walking in it. Moving like the whirlwind. It's a heritage. Aeons before Jesus came. It's a cause to be normal. It's a cause. That's why everything overwhelms us. Everything wearies us out. We don't know what we have been called into. We have been summoned into that which is as ancient as God. 
And there are testimonies to that effect. When the New Testament story began, the standard was never lowered. The Bible spoke concerning Peter. A point came, there was no need praying for the sick. Put them on the streets. When they come out of the prayer hall, you know, that's why I tell our generation, prayer is not about sweating. It's about tapping into your heritage in Christ. When these men went to pray, if they come out, it's not they sweat on their suit. When you pray, you will sweat. But they came with the witness of heaven. In Acts 5.15, they put the sick on the road. Who told them? That means if you have somebody in the hospital and they told you Peter is coming, quickly go and discharge him. Today, they will tell you, doctors will tell you, don't hear what any pastor tells you. We are advising you, better take your drug. And if you try it, you will see something. But in the days of Peter, when he's passing, they will carry people from the village, put them on the street. He doesn't need to lay hands when his shadow touches them. Whatever they call that sickness, it is cleansed. They knew something. They had something. Paul was speaking in 2 Corinthians 11 from verse 25. He had suffered shipwreck three times. Paul said, a day and a half, I was in the deep. The man fell into the river. He refused to die. He became like an aquatic creature. A day and a half, I was in the deep. He cheated death because he carried something that could tell death, go back. But here we are every day. Somebody said we will die. We already have high blood pressure. But these were men that defied death. When he couldn't walk, they, they gathered him physically, stoned him to death. The Bible said the believer stood around him. He stood up. He said, let's go to the next city. What did they carry? What is in them? I want to tell you what is in them. It's the Holy Ghost. And that is the confidence that we have. If they manifested it, we must manifest it. And we will manifest more. Because the Bible said, behind them is a desolate wilderness. But before them is the garden of the Lord. That means everything they did is a rehearsal for what we will do. A generation is about to rise that will walk in the order that Christ himself walked in. Because he said, the works that I do, he said, you shall do also. He said, and greater works than this shall ye do. In John 7, 38 and 39, he said, on the last day of the feast, which was the greatest day, Jesus stood up and cried with a loud voice. He said, they that believe in me, he said, out of their belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Do you know the difference? In their generation, they drew with cups. Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3, he said, with joy, they drew what? Waters out of the wells of salvation. So everything the Old Testament saints did were the cups of water they drank. We are not drinking cups. We are overflowing rivers from the chambers of our spirit. I prophesy over someone. The testimony of your life will make what Elijah did to be like a joke. Very quickly. Let's go into scriptures. And leave stories. The Holy Ghost is the river that we must express. And without the Holy Ghost, nothing will flow out of you. Even Jesus, who is the Word, needed the Holy Ghost to manifest. In John chapter 1 from verse 1, he said, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He said, The same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him. 
without him was not anything made that was made in him was life the life was the light of men so four credentials were quoted number one he was god number two creator number three life number four light but he didn't do anything until matthew chapter 3 from verse 15 to 17 he came to be baptized john told him no i should be baptized of you suffer it to be so for now thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness and as he was baptized coming out of the water praying he said the spirit alighted upon him like a dove in the fashion of a dove and a voice spoke from heaven this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased mark 1 12 matthew 4 1 luke 4 1 the spirit drove him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil luke 4 14 he returned in the power of the spirit he returned the river had been installed the river was about to flow immediately he entered the synagogue look for 18 the spirit of the lord is upon me for he has anointed me and he began to show us chambers to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives recovery of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised acts 10 38 how god anointed jesus of nazareth with the holy ghost and power who went about doing good healing all that were oppressed of the devil when the holy ghost comes he becomes the river flowing from within your spirit and for those of us who are in the order of christ when the holy ghost comes the river he flows from our spirit are number one all the realities of christ everything that is of christ that's what the holy ghost brings out from us because when he comes number one he installs jesus in you the holy ghost has two primary assignments in the life of the believer number one is to install christ in you so that christ becomes your software that's why i began by telling you that christ in you is the hope of glory that's what the Holy Ghost came to do. Your operating system. Have you been touched by the message you just heard and you want to give your life to Jesus or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then say this short prayer. Lord, I admit I am a sinner. I need and want your forgiveness. I accept your death as the penalty for my sin and recognize that your mercy and grace is a gift you offer to me because of your great love, not based on anything I have done. Cleanse me and make me your child. Be faithy receive you into my heart as the Son of God and as Savior and Lord of my life. From now on, help me live for you, with you in control. In your precious name, Amen. Congratulations to you. If you have just said that prayer, you are now a child of God. Look around you for a Bible-believing church and also ask Jesus to direct you to the church where you can continue to serve Him. Consider subscribing to this channel too, so that you'll keep learning the realities of God's kingdom. God bless you.